Communication and collaboration. Both are constantly brought up in faculty meetings and professional development conferences for educators all the time. All the time. Some call them new literacies. Other people call them soft skills. Others call them that thing I wish I spent more time on in school instead of learning about quadratic equations or who Millard Fillmore is. Whatever the case may be, educators everywhere want to foster development in communication and collaboration, but teaching those skills, let alone figuring out how to assess development in those skills, is no easy task. In this episode of Engage, we're going to focus first on a game that does a phenomenal job of emphasizing how communication is the key when working together in a collaborative context. Published in 2014 by RR Games and designed by Antoine Bauza, Hanabi is a clever little cooperative card game that thrusts players into a volatile baptism by fireworks frenzy. The locals are on the edges of their fold up chairs, cheering in anticipation for another one of your team's legendary displays of pyrotechnical wizardry. But just as the concession stand lights go out, you and your team realize that your precious powders, fuses, and rockets are all jumbled up. It's up to you and your team to think fast to sort out this mess on the fly because it's showtime and the show must go on. That's how the pros get it done, right? I mean, right? Yeah, one would hope that real-life pyrotechnic professionals are just a wee bit more meticulously prepared for coordinating our favorite fireworks shows and the team that you are a part of in this game. But hey, you know, having the ability to improvise on the spot in case anything goes wrong is a crucially underrated skill to have in life, right? In any case, what drew my attention into this game, just like those blink you'll miss some super loud white popping fireworks that are in every fireworks show ever, is that when you pick up the cards that you are dealt in this game, you're not allowed to look at them. You're not allowed to look at your own hand. You have to face everything outward for all your teammates to see, as this is a cooperative game. Only your teammates are able to see what kinds of colored powders you have in your repertoire, and so it is up to your teammates to provide you with clues that will help you navigate the darkness and figure out which fuses to kindle and when the timing is right to do so. If done right, you and your team will create a fireworks display that starts by slowly building suspense with one-off pops of each color and gingerly ramping up until arriving triumphantly at the big finish. When it is your turn, you have one of three possible actions to choose from. Option one, you may give a clue to another player about what is currently in their stockpile. Option two, you may choose to take a chance and light one of the fireworks in your stockpile and hope that it's a legal play. In this case, it's not because the blue four, we're not ready for the blue four yet. We only have one and two out here so far. Option three, you may choose to discard a card from your stockpile, but if you do so, it is removed for the entire rest of the game. Now, while Hanabi thematically puts players into a high pressure situation, unlike in a game like Fuse, players are not literally racing to beat the clock. 
No, instead, there are these eight blue clock tokens on the table that represent the precious few moments that are ticking by as your team is racing to salvage the operation of the show and make the fireworks show work as it's supposed to. If you are choosing the first option out of those three possible actions and you choose to share information with another player around the table, when you check those eight blue clock tokens, if there are some available, you can go ahead and flip one of them over and then you can go ahead and give that player some information. But because time is of the essence, and the show must go on, you may only give one of the following types of clues. You can either only give a clue that pertains to the color of the fireworks someone else is holding, or the specific numerical value of the fireworks that they are holding, as the numbers on the cards represent how the fireworks are bundled together. So for instance, if a player wanted to share a clue about one kind of color that another player was holding, they could check those markers to see if a clue is available, and then go to say, this card is red, and point to it like so. If, however, that same player wanted to give a clue about the green fireworks that that other player was holding, they would have to give complete information and let them know about all the green fireworks in their hand. So they would have to say, this card is green, and this card is green. Again, the same rule applies when giving a clue about the numerical value of the fireworks that somebody has currently in their stockpile. So in the same example, my friend could check to see if a clue is left, flip it over, and then say that this card is a five and point to it like so. However, if they're giving information about ones in the other player's hand, they'd have to check to see if a clue is available, flip that over, and then say this card is a one, and this card is a one. Now, what's particularly interesting here is there's no specific rule regulating how that information is conveyed. The only requirement stated in the rules is that a player must give complete information. That means that what's important here is not only what information is being conveyed at any given moment, but how that information is being conveyed. In other words, it's not just what you say, but how you say it. The order in which you structure your thoughts, the tone and inflection in which you voice those thoughts, and the awareness of your very human audience and how they're going to receive that information, interpret it, and act upon it. Do you see? This isn't just some silly game about taking on the role of a bunch of bumbling pyrotechnics who are fiddling around blindly for explosive materials like they're the punchline of some old-timey slapstick silent film. No! Anabi is a brilliant crash course in communication, specifically when you're thinking about how to teach persuasive writing. When you have the opportunity to share a clue in Hanabi, you have to think very carefully about what information you want to communicate, who needs that information the most in the heat of the moment, and how you are going to share that information so that your teammate interprets what you have to say and actually makes the move that you want them to make. Oh, okay, sure, yeah, but what does this have to do with persuasive writing again? When you have the opportunity to share a clue in Hanabi, you have to think very carefully about what information you want to communicate, who needs that information the most in the heat of the moment, and how are you going to communicate that information to your teammate so they actually take the action you are trying to convince them to take. Okay, you covered that? You got that one? Oh. Okay, looks like you covered all your bases. Now, in the game of Hanabi, the commission fireworks display is expected to ramp up slowly over time to build suspense. This is an extravaganza you're putting together, after all. Not some one-trick Roman candle in the middle of a parking lot somewhere. As such, players must play each set of colored fireworks cards in rising order, starting with the one-off pops and finishing off with the ferocious five finales. Uh, Jeremy? Okay. We could add fireworks later. Uh, yeah, we, we don't have the budget for that. Well, maybe I'll tell him after the show. On your turn, if you choose not to give a clue to another player, or there's no more time to do so if all the blue clock tokens are face down, you may choose to play a card from your hand and see if you could contribute it to one of the active fireworks displays. 
Keep in mind that when a player chooses to play a card, the other players are strictly forbidden by the rules to comment or otherwise influence that player's decision in any way. This is without a doubt the most challenging aspect of Hanabi, as it takes more willpower than one might expect to restrain yourself from reacting to your teammate's thought process either verbally or through body language. If you are analyzing the concept of dramatic irony when studying literature with your students, Hanabi provides a wonderful opportunity for students to experience firsthand that delicious tension that ensues when a reader or the audience learns something about a main character's fate that that main character knows nothing about. And of course, the audience, just like the other players in this game, are powerless to be able to intervene when that main character is about to make a choice that could have explosive consequences. If a player decides to light a fuse and he or she is successful at deducing which card would be the correct card to play next for the current game state, the card is added to the appropriate display and the crowd will rejoice. Successfully completing a full set from 1 to 5 of a single color also dazzles the audience, buying you a little additional time for sharing more clues. If However, a player has chosen poorly, the incorrect card gets discarded from the game permanently, and one of the dreaded black fuse tokens is turned over. You and your team have only got room for three snafus before... If on your turn you decide against giving a clue, or you've run out of time anyways, and you decide you're not in the best position to make a play, the only other option that remains is to trash one of your supply stocks and rummage through what's left in the pyrotechnic pile. The good news when choosing to discard a card is that you buy your team a little more time to share information. In other words, you get to take one of those blue clock tokens that has been used already and turn it back over to the clock side. But the bad news is, if you choose to discard a card, that card is G-O-N-E gone for the rest of the game. There's no way you can get that back. And this is particularly important because you and your pyrotechnic pals only had so much of a budget to put on the show, and so if you discard a card from the game that was one of your big finishers, there's no way to get that back. It's gone. If you and your team manage to make it through without making the three mistakes that lead to triggering the accidental explosion that blows everything up at once, the game ends either when you and your team complete the fireworks display with all five sets of colors, or play ends when the draw pile is depleted and each player, including the player who drafted the last supply out of the stock, takes one final turn. You might not be able to make a fully complete fireworks display at that point, but you might do a good enough job to at least convince the locals to hire you back for next year's celebration. And that, my friends, is how a basic game of Hanabi is played. I did say basic because there's more. When you open the box, you'll no doubt notice that there is also a set of multicolored firework cards. If you and your team were able to wow the crowd with the perfect performance of the red, white, blue, yellow, and green fireworks, see if you can up the ante by treating these multicolored cards as its own separate set. When playing this challenging variant, whenever players choose to provide a clue pertaining to color, players must always include any multicolored card as part of that clue. For example, in this challenging variant, let's say my teammate had this hand, and I knew that we had the opportunity to play a blue three. So if I was going to give them a clue about color, I could go ahead, play a clue if it's available, and say, this card is blue, but I would have to also say, and this card is blue, because it is. It's blue, and it's red, and green, and yellow, and white. So the way in which I share that information with my teammate is going to make all the difference. Now, if you and your team are able to complete all six of these sets together without making a single error and long before getting to the end of the draw deck, congratulations. I mean, you should consider launching a startup together or something or making a movie because if you are all on the same wavelength to that extent, you're an incredible team. Thank you to Antoine Bauza for designing this incredible test of communication skills, and thank you to Albertine Relenti and Jen Vargas for all the bold and beautiful artwork that made this game snap, crackle, and pop with delight. Special thanks to all these fine musicians that granted me permission to use their music as part of this video. 
And an extra special thanks goes out to my friends Dave, Jim, Matt, Reyna, and Yoni for helping to make this video possible. As well as Zach of Beyond the Studio Productions for helping to clean up the vocals of this episode. And thank you for watching and sharing this video using the hashtags Games4Ed with the number 4 and Playful Learning on your favorite social media platforms to help share ideas for how to facilitate learning through play in classrooms across the globe. And for choosing to support your friendly local neighborhood game stores. Until next time, I've been Jeremy, and this has been Engage, where learning through play is the name of the game. We'll see you next time. <laughs>